Okay, good morning everyone and thank you very much for joining our third webinar in a series um, focusing on leadership at the Alliance Manchester Business School. Today's session is going to be titled Understanding Your Leadership DNA. So I hope you signed up for the right webinar and we'll kick off first of all with some introductions. So I'll let each of our panel members introduce themselves. Um, so first of all, I'm Dane Anderton. I'm a senior lecturer and director of programmes here at the Alliance Manchester Business School. Hi, good morning. My name is Courtney Owens. Um, I'm a lecturer at Alliance um, Manchester Business School. Um, I work primarily in the executive education department. So if you come on one of our programmes, you're likely to see me around. And good morning, everyone. My name is Kieran. I work with Dane and Courtney on executive education on the recruitment side. And just a, a quick reminder, we are recording this morning. So if you don't want to appear on the recording, it's probably best you turn your webcams off. Thank you, Kieran. Yeah, so this webinar is being recorded. So you do, you do have access to this uh, once we've finished today. So first of all, we're just going to dive into a few slides around the content of the webinar. So we're going to fo focus on why leadership development is important, what we offer here at the University of Manchester Alliance, Manchester Business School. But the vast majority of this webinar is going to be focused on your leadership DNA, which is going to be led by Dr. Courtney Owens. And there will be time at the end for a question and answer session. We usually leave around 10 minutes, um, but feel free at any point throughout this webinar to put your, chat, your um, questions in our chat function, which is at the bottom of the screen. So leadership development uh, at Manchester Alliance Manchester Business School. What do we believe in when we're saying uh, what we offer in terms of leadership development? Well, our programs are about saying leadership is a skill set that all firms across all sectors need to survive. OK, firms, whether you're in engineering, whether you're in uh, hospitality, leadership is going to be around and going to be something that you're going to have to invest in and think about for your employees. You know, we can't just take the assumption anymore that people are natural leaders there are skill sets that can be developed and that's what we believe in and our philosophy around our programs is that we through these types of programs we can accelerate just waiting for the next slide sorry to load up sorry we can accelerate how managers and leaders think strategically okay so it's not just about standing in front of people and leading people in the right direction but being able to take decisions to think strategically develop new capabilities for yourself and the organization to be able to identify new capabilities how might you go about doing that we also want you to be able to master challenges and opportunities within your organization. So we don't want to focus just on problems, but how we might seize opportunities. And this is what our programs are thinking about. And today, starting with understanding your DNA, your leadership DNA, it will get you on that way towards that. But we also want to think about the now, but also the future, how we can future proof, how we can make you a resilient leader for the future. And this factors into a number of statistics and uh, reports and thinking about the industrial strategy, the Greater Manchester local industrial strategy, many other regions have their own localised industrial strategy. It has been highlighted time and time again that in these reports that good practice, best practice management development can increase organisational performance. A report done in 2016, again by uh, the Office for National Statistics, showed that one thing that was affecting productivity, one of the key factors affecting productivity were poor leadership and management practices. So this is why it is important, and going back to my first quote, that leadership is a skill set that all firms need in order to survive. We cannot just assume that people become. There are certain elements of that leadership landscape that we need to kind of think about and learn and have critical friendship on. So today's session is actually taken from a program that called the Manchester Leadership Development Program. And I'm not kind of spending too much time on this program at the moment, but wanted to tell you that this session comes from day one of this program about understanding leadership. We believe that by starting with you as the leader of a team, maybe as someone who deals with finance strategy and innovation, we've got to start with you. Okay. And the program aims that we go through for the Manchester Leadership Development, just to put in context what's coming next, 
the first session is about evaluating your personal leadership using psychometrics. So not take, I don't want to go into too much depth here, because uh, I'm sure Courtney will, will um, show you a lot more than I can. But also the other three, other four days that follow this type of course, just to kind of, again, put it into the wider context. How, do you, how does your personal leadership help you influence others and lead others? How does it help you give an appreciation of financial management? How can you develop that language to speak across the organization, to take strategic decisions and think about your innovative capabilities? But then putting it all together, but how do we actually implement those opportunities or take those opportunities forward? How do we implement change? Well, we usually do that through projects. And again, all in all, this is about applying new understanding around five core functions of the organization. And, our, and, our, and the Manchester Leadership Development Programme here, uh, just to kind of give you the ins and outs, five units, again, putting in context around leadership, teams, projects, finance, and strategy. You can get an award at the end of this if you wanted to, plus executive coaching if you were to join us. This is just one example of a whole range of programmes that we offer. And we deliver in multiple formats. So sometimes we deliver in a full week block, five days, or we have a more flexible approach, which is one, one day usually every other week on this one. So we went around the business school, people who teach on our programs, uh, especially the Manchester Leadership Development Program, and said, think of those key days, those key functions that we have on this program, and what are your kind of key takeaways in this kind of COVID-19 world? And I'm just going to leave these on screen and probably pick out just one or two of these now. But one of the key ones that we said around leading teams, for example, is about empowering your team. You know, create a sense of community um, whilst you're still working at distance or as people return to work, make sure that, you've, that you reestablish that sense of community. And thinking about strategy and innovation, a lot of firms now are having to rethink their strategy to adapt to all these different changes. But what, are the, what is the key takeaway from strategy and innovation? It's about keeping it simple. Complex strategies don't translate across the organization. So keeping it simple means people will be able to absorb it, work towards it, and hopefully then the long-term um, advantage of the organization is, is sustained. So that was a quick flit around um, the Manchester Leadership Development Programme and putting into context why we've taken this session out and are going to focus this webinar on understanding leadership DNA. So it's my um, privilege to introduce to Courtney Owens, who's going to take you through um, understanding leadership DNA. Courtney. Great. Thank you, Dane. Yeah, so our session, um, what we'll talk about today, and this is um, what we talk about in our leadership day in our um, sessions when you come for our executive programs is understanding your leadership DNA and what we mean by that your DNA your your inside bit right so for um, my discussion today we're going to be talking about really personality traits and how do those personality traits then affect your different leadership styles so that's what we'll be talking about today um, but before we get into that I wanted to share a little bit about me um, the minute I start talking you can see the wheels turning people are thinking where is she from where's that accent um, where is she from and we always start off any conversation with um, me talk them trying to find out where I'm from and me identifying the city so I normally try to get people to guess can you guess based on my accent where I'm from um, since we aren't face to face here I thought I'd give you another hint and give you a um, picture of where I'm from. So we're going to do a poll here. And so Karen's got a couple of polls for us throughout our time together. Um, I like to present in a more interactive style and that's hard in these kind of webinar, webinar sessions. So we're going to try some polls today to get some interaction going. So can you identify this city? There's a list there. And so you just click on um, the city that you think it is. Um, do rather than using the chat if you could use the poll here okay thanks Courtney so this is the this is Kieran here so we're just seeing a few people voting at the moment most of you I think over 70% of you have voted I'm just gonna leave it for a, about 10 10 more seconds um, and then I'll share the results with you and that's what we're gonna be doing throughout this uh, this webinar so there'll be a couple more of these to come where you will get to see the results at the end so I'm going to wrap up the polling now and share it with you. Hopefully, uh, is it a surprise? Hey, 84% voted correctly for Seattle. Well done. 
Right, so actually everything on this list here, all of these cities are places that I've lived. Um, Seattle with the Space Needle there. Um, yes, that's where I grew up. That's where I attended university. That's, um, I went back to university, got my MBA degree, um, started my own business and um, worked in San Francisco and in Boise, Idaho. Um, moved across the United States to Boston. That's where I first encountered the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs test, and I took that while I was at work there. Um, had that first aha moment when you take a personality test and you go, oh my gosh, this is me. Um, and that's really started my journey into psychometrics. Um, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, nobody voted for that. Um, I did live and work there for a while. I took my business there um, and then eventually came to Manchester um, to study for a PhD. And I've been here ever since. So my research is in the area of personality traits, um, job performance, and leadership styles. And so we'll be drawing in some of that research as we talk today. All right. Thank you, Karen. Next slide. So what we'll be talking about today um, is really just starting with an overview of psychometrics, why we use them, how we use them. Um, we'll get into some specifics about the Hogan uh, personality test. That's the one we use um, quite often here at the business school. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that and why we use it. Um, and then we'll talk about what this means for your leadership style. Um, once you identified your traits, that has implications for how others perceive you and how others choose to follow you. Um, so we'll talk about what that means for your leadership style. And then once you know that knowledge about yourself, how you can use that to become a better leader. So that's the structure of what we'll talk about today um, as we go through this. Right, so psychometrics. Personality tests specifically, here's a variety of different tests that are available out there. Um, the first one that came up, which Disney character are you, right? So there's a whole bunch of these um, silly little personality tests that are out there on social media. Which Disney character are you? Which um, Avenger are you? Uh, what does your foot size tell you about your personality, right? So we take these tests and they're kind of fun and we say, oh, isn't that silly, that's like me, or that's not like me. Um, but inherently we know that um, these kinds of tests aren't valid, right? We shouldn't use these to try to predict this is what it means for your leadership style, or this is what it means for the different kinds of jobs you might be good at. We know that these are just silly little tests. But we need to take that kind of assessment on whether it's reliable and valid and decide that also about these other tests that we use. So for example, the Myers-Briggs. This one's really popular, um, especially in the States. Um, it's got a huge um, consulting effort behind it that sells its tests. Um, and it's great for some things and not so great for some other things. So scientifically, when we've analyzed this test, we know that it does not predict job performance. So using it to try to predict whether or not somebody's going to do well in a certain job is not a good use for this test. It does have other strengths and for understanding um, interpersonal, um, interpersonal strengths and weaknesses and areas where of potential interpersonal conflict. So it's really good in understanding team dynamics. So it depends on how you use this test, as all of them. Um, reliability and validity varies, so you want to use it for how it's meant to be used. Um, the big five is um, down here in the lower right, five personality traits, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. Scientifically, this one has the most research behind it. Um, so this is the one we'll use most often in academic research when we look at testing personality traits. Now the limitations with this one is it's only five traits, there's way more personality traits out there than just five. Um, so that really limits what we can measure, as well as it also measures the entire spectrum um, of uh, personality and doesn't look specifically at the workplace. So the Hexaco is not as well known. Um, it's an extension of the big five. It's added one, honesty, humility has been added on. Um, so this is a good model as well. And then the Hogan, what we've got in the middle here. So the Hogan personality tests, um, there's a suite of three um, different tests that they use, the HPI, HDS, and MVPI. So the HPI measures 
the bright side, your normal personality. The HDS measures um, the dark side of your personality. And the MVPI is what we say measures the inside, your values and your internal preferences that come out through your personality traits. So um, some things that are great about the Hogan and why we use it is um, the validity and reliability that we know about it. It's a reliable test. You take it once. You take it again, your scores don't change. That's one of the problems with the MBTI. You take it once, a couple years later, you take it again, you might have a different um, score. You'll have a different personality. Well, one of the definitions of personality is, is it doesn't change over the long haul. So we want tests that show that your personality doesn't change because if something's changing, then something likely is wrong with the test. So the Hogan has, um, is, we're trusted in its reliability and its validity is good because it predicts um, workplace performance. It was built specifically for measuring your, your personality in the context of the workplace. We can look a little different, right? At home and at work or at the pub with our mates or um, you know, these different circumstances we can be in express different parts of our personality. So who we are at work is really the focus of um, how the Hogan personality tests were built. Um, so we really like to use the Hogan in our um, leadership programs. All right, let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna talk a little more about um, the Hogan test so specifically. We do have that poll lined up if you oh, wanna run We do that have one. a poll, yes, thank you, I forgot. Uh, right, so another poll. So let's take the poll here of these five different uh, personality tests. Which um, test have you taken? And you can click on more than one if you've taken more than one. So folks, same drill as the last time. If you pick one, I'm really intrigued to see how many have taken Disney. <laughs> some good polling going on looking some strong numbers yeah disney's doing more popular than i thought it would okay that's about half of you have voted if you would like to vote this is anonymous we won't be using this against you particularly the disney votes i'm going to give about five to ten more seconds just for the last few people and then i'm going to share the results with you folks so we're going to wrap up and end the polling now and there you go, Courtney. Interesting result. Yes. A few have taken the Disney. Um, MBTI, yeah, it's really popular. Um, so as I said, it's good for some things, not so great for other things. So it just depends on how you use the results of the test. So be careful with that one. Um, a few people have experienced the Hexco, some the big five. 20% with the Hogan. So um, the Hogan is, um, again, I'll be talking more about it, but that is something you'll have an opportunity to take if you come on one of our programs. Great. Thank you, Karen. So we're going to talk next about um, the Hogan specifically, and it comes as a suite of three different um, personality tests. So the first one, the HPI, um, looks at your bright side, your normal personality, and really just wants to look at your strengths and whether or not can you do this job. Um, the HDS is the dark side. And so that looks at what will get in the way. Um, what are the risks that might um, prevent you from doing well at work? And then the MVPI is, will you like the job that you are going to be working at? Do you like, would you fit well um, in that environment? So let's break this down and look at each one a little bit more in detail. So the HPI, the Hogan Personality Inventory. So what does it test? This tests our normal or our bright side personality. This is when we're um, at our best in normal good circumstances. These are the strengths that we play to. Um, personality is a characteristic pattern of what your normal choices would be and what your normal expression of your personality is. So it varies. Uh, based on circumstance, but this is your normal pattern of who you are. So this is the HPI, and these are our strengths. So we want to play to our strengths um, when we look at our leadership style. Next slide. So the MVPI stands for Motives, Values, and Preferences Inventory, and this looks at what drives our personality from the inside. Um, so this has to do with your motivation and your values. So things that are going on inside that help express 
um, those different personality traits, your core values, your core interests. And what's important about this is when you identify this, it helps you know the best environment where you'll succeed. Um, so things on this test are things like, um, are you motivated or do you value um, fame or fortune, right? Do you want um, recognition or do you just want monet monetary um, rewards for your effort? Um, or do you value security? Do you want a job where you know it's secure um, and you're not going to be let go? So these things um, change. This is one where it does change over the course of time because your different life stages sometimes um, affect what's important to you. But knowing this helps you to understand the kind of environment where you will fit best. So if security is the best fit for you at this time in your life, then you most likely don't want to get a job with an entrepreneur or a startup, right? Because there's not much security in that job you don't know. So taking this test just helps you identify the best kind of fit for your personality. And the last one we're gonna talk about is the Hogan Development Survey, the HDS. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time um, on this. So this is our dark side. Uh, these are the dark traits and what happens here is everybody has these. It's just um, something that comes out um, when we're stressed or in times of pressure. So for example, now in the pandemic, right, things are uncertain. Um, we might be doing our job well and still doing those things that have been um, those tasks set before us, but we're still under pressure. And so it's in these kinds of times that these traits can emerge um, and can be come our um, downfall and can really damage our reputation, derail our chances of success. So the way we deal with this is trying to recognize what they are. And once we recognize and acknowledge it, then we can deal with it. So that's why we want to take the HDS, find out the results. Um, what are these areas that are potential challenges, potential pitfalls, so we can address them. All right. So the HDS, what um, what are the traits that it measures? There's three different categories that it looks at. Distancing, seductive, and ingratiating, right? So these are the dark traits. Um, so these are things that are not so good about us, even though the words might look like um, positive things. And at times they can be positive, but at times they can be negative as well. Um, so let's talk about these three different categories, distancing, seductive, and ingratiating. Um, distancing, right? These are things that put distance between you and someone else. So let's take skeptical, for example, right? You're on a team, um, somebody's got a great idea, they're going to go forward with this, and um, your skepticism comes out and the negativity and you begin to attack this idea. Now, in some cases, that can be a good thing because we don't want groupthink to happen. We want to be um, make sure we're making the best decision. But if it goes too far and you become so skeptical and negative that you can't even embrace the idea that the person has put forward, that's where this moves into dangerous territory because now it's putting distance between you and the other person, between you and the team, um, and you're not even approachable to have a discussion um, to talk about the idea. So there's different, it's when this comes to the extreme is when this becomes um, risky and can damage uh, your reputation. So that's what distancing traits are. Seductive, right? So seducing, right? It's pulling in um, somebody to maybe even against their will. This is something that's very attractive um, and pulls them in. So someone who maybe is um, mischievous, mischievous or colorful, right? That, that's, that's attractive. You want to get closer to them and spend time with them. Um, even though maybe somebody, you might have a sense of there's some reason I feel like I can't trust them, but it's really attractive that um, I want to spend more time with them. Those are these seductive traits. And um, colorful is an example of that. We're going to talk more about colorful in a minute. Um, ingratiating is the last category here. So ingratiating is this idea that you are deliberately trying to look good um, for others. You want others to perceive you as a hard worker. Um, I do my job. I do more than what's expected of me. I'm really good. Um, I'm a great team player. So these are good traits, again, but when taken to the extreme, um, can 
be a downfall. So that's the ingratiating, and we're gonna talk more here about dutiful in particular. So we're gonna use colorful and dutiful as an example in a couple of slides here. But first, let's do another poll. So in a minute here, you're gonna um, have a chance to vote, but let me just explain what this question means. So what I'm asking you is, um, what is the average number of risky traits? So that's defined as moderate to high risk. And when you take the test, you typically get a score of zero to 100. Um, so anything 70 and higher is considered a risk category. So that would be moderate to high risk traits. So what do you think is the average number um, of risky traits in the general working population that's out there? So let's take a poll and see if you can guess. Okay, folks, so once again, exactly the same as last time. Pick a number. Do you think it's zero, one, two, three, four, or five or more for those numbers of high risk or moderate to high risk traits? Okay, uh, that's, that's about two thirds of you have voted. I'm just going to give a couple of seconds more. Okay, I think that's about everybody that we've got. I'm going to end the polling and share the results with you all. Five or more, 34%, three, 32%. Right, so almost a third split between voting for three and five. Um, two and four come in next. Right, so nobody said zero. Maybe you picked that up from the way I was talking about it, that everybody has um, these traits. So um, for risky traits, yeah, so the answer here is actually four. Um, so most of you are kind of in that area. Um, and so this is the average person out there, right, has four, which means probably all of us on the call, we probably either have three, four, or five traits where we would score in the high risk category. So that's just to acknowledge that, hey, everybody's got this. It's okay. It's normal. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're a bad leader or you're not going to succeed. It's just a way to acknowledge that, okay, I've got these traits. What am I going to do about it? All right. Thank you, Karen. Let's go on to the next slide. So what am I going to do about it is the next question, right? So let's pause on the personality traits for a minute and talk about leadership. So here's our working definition um, of leadership. Leadership is the ability of an individual to influence, motivate, and enable others to contribute toward the effectiveness and success of the organizations of which they are members. Okay, so the bit I like to focus on here is that second line, um, influence, motivate, and enable others. Okay, so this is a little different than that person who's climbing to the top of the mountain and they're on their own and they're leading the way, right? This is something about influencing those people that are following you. You are in relationship with them and you're influencing them. You're motivating them to succeed and you're enabling them to succeed. So this is the definition of leadership that we're talking about here. So to be able to do this, um, in relation to our personality traits, there's no specific personality trait that makes the perfect leader. Um, what we see now in times of pandemic, right, it's all about adaptability, flexibility, re responding to the conditions. So there's no one person that's perfect. What um, key is key here is being able to um, recognize what your strengths are and play your strengths to those those changing situations. So you need to be able to adapt actually and pull out the right strengths at the right time. Um, so really anyone with any traits can be a leader. I don't think that there is um, certain traits that prohibit you or certain traits that mean you're going to be a star. What I think is key is self-awareness and becoming aware of what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and how to um, mitigate the risks and build on those strengths and that enables you um, to be a leader. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so back to these two traits of colorful and dutiful. Um, so what we're gonna do is have a chance to vote again. Um, and you can identify for yourself 
um, which trait maybe um, is more likely to be high on your list. Um, and then we're gonna take this and apply it to a leadership situation um, and put the two ideas together of leadership and personality traits. So let's talk about this. These two traits, um, it's possible you could be high on both or you could be low on both. Um, so since you haven't had an opportunity to take the test yet, um, or if you have and you remember your scores, you can vote that way. Um, but if you haven't taken the test um, or you don't remember, let me give you the definitions of these two and you can think about yourself. And just what I wanna do for the voting here is just pick which one you think you might be higher on, right? So colorful um, fell in that uh, seductive um, category. So this is somebody who is very dramatic and entertaining. They like to be upfront and have attention. Um, one of the downsides of this kind of personality is they actually can get bored kind of quickly. And so they sort of jump to new things. They want some constant stimulation and get really excited about new projects. So this is what um, a colorful, dramatic person um, might look like. So that's one type of personality trait. Um, another trait is called dutiful. Um, and this was in that ingratiating category where you're really concerned about or you want others to think well of you, um, right? And so this is a person who is very agreeable and they're pleasant, they're easy to get along with, um, they're a really good organizational citizen, they do their job, they show up on time, they maybe stay late, um, they work extra hard. Um, they're great team players. One of the downside of this um, is sometimes in um, wanting to please that they'll maybe over promise and under deliver. Um, so have a think about these two. Um, obviously this is not a very scientific poll, but if you had to pick one um, that you felt you were might score higher on, um, which one would that be? So I think Karen's got a poll for us on this. And again, hey. it's anonymous. Sorry. Yeah. So don't yeah. don't worry. We're not we're not uh, recording the the, the yeah. polls. You will get a copy of the slides afterwards and a recording, but the polls won't be included. Um, so yeah, looks like uh, seventy seven percent of you have voted so far. A few more just creeping in. I think the votes are almost in. I'm going to give you about two or three more seconds. Just decide whether you're colourful or dutiful. Which do you feel is more a good description of you? And we're going to end the poll. And these are the results. Okay, right. So, um, almost, let's see, 28% colorful, 72% dutiful. Right, so three quarters of us would say, yeah, probably dutiful would be a better description of me. Okay, so let's, let's talk about these. Um, Obviously, as I said before, this is not scientific, so don't take this away and, um, and worry about it. But if you do um, take the Hogan test, this is um, just kind of an example of what you might experience as we go through it. Um, so let's move on to the next slide, please. And talk about the, um, what does this mean for your leadership style? So putting this together, right? Personality traits and leadership. Um, so colorful, what are the strengths of this? Um, lively, engaging, typically makes a really good first impression, right? This might be um, a classic example of this could be uh, your business development type people, your salespeople. They, they are engaging, they're energetic, that first impression, um, you, en you enjoy spending time with them. Um, they have a lot to say. Um, so these are great um, strengths, um, but then they also come with some challenges. So let's also talk about dutiful first. Um, so dutiful, what are the strengths of this for their leadership style? Is that they are eager to please their superiors. So they will work with um, the people they are um, supervising to do their best to please their superiors. Um, they're quite agreeable, they're easy to get along with, probably their door is always open, uh, right? So those um, that they supervise feel welcome to come in and share and talk. Um, they make really good team players. So these are great strengths, but we also wanna acknowledge it, the challenges and the weaknesses about that. So. Thank you, Karen. Um, right, so if you scored higher on um, 
colorful. What does this mean for your leadership style? Um, the problem here is that when you get really excited about all these new projects, when you're in a leadership position, um, other people see that in you and they, um, they feel like you get easily distracted and that it's hard to follow you as a leader because if you're constantly changing um, the direction you're going and they're trying to follow you, then um, they get confused on what exactly is the direction we're going. What are the expectations you have of them? There's no solid ground. Things are constantly changing. So it makes it hard um, to follow you as a leader um, if this is the way that you're constantly changing um, the direction that you're going. Dutiful, right? Dutiful looks um, like a, a, a great strength, but in times um, of pressure, um, or in stress, and this goes to the extreme, this can actually become a weakness as well. So the areas where this becomes a weakness, things that can come into play here is um, that it's, the two examples I have here are you can rely too heavily on others in your decision-making process, right? That sometimes you just have to make a decision and, and decide the direction you're going to go. That um, if you're spending too much time getting agreement from others, it slows down the process. And then actually you're maybe even never voicing your own opinion. Um, or it can make um, the people you supervise can feel disempowered. Um, by that kind of leadership style. So there's challenges um, that have to go with these. Don't worry, we aren't gonna leave you hanging. We'll give you some um, tools on, on how to address these challenges. But before we go there, um, let's talk a little bit about um, what does this look like? Um, and so I've got some questions for Kieran. He's um, uh, indicated to me he's willing to share a little bit. Um, so I believe that Karen has taken um, these tests. Karen, can you tell us a little bit about your experience um, taking the Hogan personality tests? Yeah, thanks, Courtney. Yeah, I took um, all three of the tests. I took the Hogan Development Survey as part of a leadership development program, probably about last September. And um, very, very easy uh, series of questions online, 20 minutes, the whole thing. And I got the report back. Um, it was a very, very interesting read. It took me a while to digest the information, but uh, it was an interesting read. Okay. So how did you feel when you got your results? Maybe especially the um, Hogan Development Survey, which is the dark side, right? How well, did yeah. you feel when you, when you saw that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, uh, to be honest, you're somewhat skeptical you know, and kind of apprehensive. Okay. What's this going to say about me? This is that part of yourself that maybe you don't see or you're, you're dimly aware of. Yeah. Um, but as I started to read through it, it, it did resonate. It did make sense. I could recognize myself. And the way it was written, it didn't make me feel ashamed for these behaviors, but it okay. did actually kind of pull out a few things that kind of reminded me of where I've had problems in my career in the past or problems mm -hmm. in a project. So it, I did actually find it quite useful in the end. Okay, great. Yeah, and that's what that's what we hope to accomplish is to to say, okay, these these are things where, yeah, I might see now how it's impacted my progress, and here's what I could change in the future. So, so we've been talking about these two particular traits, colorful and dutiful. Um, which one did you score higher on when you took the test? Well, I came out pretty high on dutiful, um, okay. which which again, you read it and you think, oh, that's 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 very nice, and that's that's good. Um, part of my job and for those people who, who, who know me and work with me know that, you know, you try and get there on time and, and it's with the best of intentions. You, you want to get the job done and yes. kind of want to tick every box and cross everything off the list. That being said, when I got to the part where it sort of said, look, you may find yourself overstretched at some times. You may want to do more than you've actually got capacity to do or even sometimes finding it hard to say no to people. Mm. Um, again, that that really resonated. Now, it, it just started that conversation in my, with myself and um, with my colleagues about, okay, now I'm aware of it. What are the implications? Maybe I need to, to, to understand when I'm going to need to say no occasionally. Right, right. Good. Um, right. So thank you for sharing with us. Um, it's it's kind of nice to hear um, an individual's um, experience with it. Um, 
you know, so it's not, it's not a bad thing. It's just exposing these are things we need to know about us ourselves. Um, and then what are we going to do going forward now that we know this? So let's, let's talk a little more now. Let's move on. Thank you, Karen. Um, and let's talk about what does this mean? So once we've identified um, these challenges, and I'm just focusing on this one, um, the HDS, right? That's a suite of personality tests that you'll be taking, but this one um, in particular is what we're talking about today. So um, I want to talk about this one article. Um, the title of the article is called In Praise of the Incomplete Leader. Um, the author is Deborah Ancona and her colleagues wrote this. And I love this title, In Praise of the Incomplete Leader. And so what I think um, this helps us to recognize is it's okay to be incomplete. It's okay to have these weaknesses. Nobody's perfect. We all know that anyway. Um, so we don't have to keep trying to be perfect. It's okay to be incomplete. Um, and so once we recognize that and we try to feel okay with that, um, then we can say, all right, um, if that's reality, if I am incomplete, what am I going to do about it? Uh, and so here's a quote from the article on, on their solution. So what are we going to do about it? They say, sometimes leaders need to further develop the capabilities they are weakest in. Other times, however, it's more important for leaders to find and work with others to compensate for their weaknesses, right? So that first part there, further develop the capabilities we are, you're weakest in. Yeah, this is normal and natural for us, right? Self-improvement um, tendencies to go out there, what am I weak in? I'm going to get better at it. That's one way to do it. But really, um, the best way to do it and the, um, the best, what's indicated here by this picture, right, in these puzzle pieces being put together as this um, part of the line, it's more important for leaders to find and work with others to compensate for their weaknesses. So if you identify those areas where you are weak um, and you can find others who are strong and where you are weak, then you can recognize if times happen um, and it, it um, requires a certain personality trait or a certain leadership style or just a certain way of being that you're not very comfortable with and you're not very good at, that you can recognize, okay, I'm not really good at, but this is necessary at this time to get through. So I'm going to have this person come in, partner along with me, and together we can move this forward because I see that it's important, but I'm not very good at it, but I know somebody who is, and together um, we can take this forward. So that's how we want to um, address those weaknesses. So let's go to our final slide here and wrap up. Um, so um, what's the final conclusion? is that um, you want to play to your strengths, definitely, and that's what we'll find in the HPI, the Hogan Personality Inventories. You'll find out those strengths. Um, but understand and acknowledge those areas um, where you have challenges or those areas of weaknesses. Because overusing your strengths or in times when you're under pressure, um, those same strengths can become weaknesses. So you want to acknowledge that. So then once you acknowledge it, you can develop a plan on how to improve um, your leadership. One way is by improving your own um, weaknesses is to, to go internal and to focus on your own areas and, that you want to work on. Um, and one way to do that um, that I recommend is by interacting with others and understanding their perspective of you. So you can approach someone and say, hey, this came up as a, a risk area on my personality test. I'm not sure if I really believe it. What do you think? And hearing that feedback uh, from somebody who knows you well, maybe a partner or a really close work colleague, hearing their feedback to say, um, yeah, actually, that's really you. And to hear an example of maybe how that's played out um, is really valuable in just increasing your self-awareness and helping you become aware of how others perceive you in the workplace. Um, so that's one way to improve your own weaknesses. And then the last point here is relying on others to compensate. So to be able to acknowledge areas that you are weak, find someone who is strong in those areas you're weak, and together then um, you can move forward. All right, so that's it for today. Thank you very much.
Okay, so um, we're going to take, I think, now we've got an opportunity. Thank you, Courtney. We're going to take a bit of a Q&A, &A, and I'd ask you to type your questions into the chat pane. Um, we've got a couple more slides to go. I'm going to point you in the direction of some of the resources we've got online at the end of this. But for now, I've got a few questions coming through. So, Courtney, are you okay if I uh, fire a couple over at, at you? So, a yeah. um, couple of questions around um, different psychometrics. People are mentioning uh, insights, disk. Um, you know, so uh, is there a particular reason we can't obviously put every single psychometric in the list of choices, yeah. but why do you feel that, why do you like personally, do you like Hogan for some of our leadership development work? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a ton of, of, um, personality tests out there. I've just picked a handful, um, for discussion purposes. Um, yeah. So why do I like the Hogan? Why do we use it at the business school? Um, because we're a business school and we're focused on the work environment and business, um, really one of the primary reasons is the Hogan was built specifically for the workplace. Um, so there's all kinds of personality traits out there. The DISC and Insights as well measure different kinds of traits, but um, they're not um, built specifically for the workplace. So the Hogan has sifted through. Um, there's some traits that kind of actually don't impact um, your job performance. So they have really um, focused in on the important bits um, and, and made it specific to um, the work environment. We also know because they publish um, not only commercially, but also um, in our academic journals. So they publish and we know the reliability and validity of their tests. We know it. Other consulting agencies sometimes, I'm just not familiar with um, the validity um, like of the DISC and Insights. I don't know if it's been published. It's not well known in our scientific journals. So because it's hidden and not accessible, um, we just don't know um, on how valid and reliable we are. Those are um, where we know the answer to that with the Hogan. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, I think, um, what, what's the interval that you would suggest between taking Hogan's? Obviously, you, there's no point really to be gained in taking it every week. Um, yeah. what, what, do you, what would you say, you know, if you wanted to see sort of over time and evolution, what would you leave it? Yeah, I would, I would leave it. So one of the, um, the, the definitions of personalities, it's a characteristic pattern of who you are. Um, so really, um, it changes up until you're about 25, um, and then your personality traits are pretty well set. Um, you could maybe take it, say, every 10 years, things might change slightly, especially um, what I would expect is the HPI probably would not change. The HDS, if you have been working on things and improving your self-awareness and changing your behaviors, that change um, might come out in the HDS, but still it would probably be... I would say at least three years before you even bother to take it again. Um, and then the MVPI actually expects you to change because it measures different life stages. Um, so that one, maybe every five to 10 years, I would, I would expect that one to actually change over time. Okay. That's good to know. Thanks. Cookie. So I've got, there's hope for me. I might not be dutiful forever. <laughs> that's right. And actually, if I, if I put it as part of a personal development plan with maybe some coaching, I could take it and expect to see some changes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Here's an interesting question. This one's from Vivian. Um, what, what styles of leadership do you think aren't, don't really lend themselves to being great team players? So what style of leadership doesn't make for a great team player? Right. Um, so these are some of those distancing traits that came up on the HDS, right? Where you distance yourselves um, from others. So um, the things on that list, excitable, excitable, skeptical, cautious, reserved, leisure, leisurely, and they each have different definitions and different things um, that they test. But they are things where um, it begins to put distance between you and others, um, where, like I mentioned before, there, there's times when you want to be skeptical. There's times when um, you want to challenge the status quo. Absolutely, there's appropriate times to do that. But what happens, um, what you need to be careful of is the times when you come to loggerheads, when you can't even make a decision, when you're not even approachable. Um, so it's just being aware. Um, sometimes it's just self-awareness. Oh, I have a tendency to react that way and to recognize that about yourself um, so that then you can sort of keep those walls to a manageable um, level so that you can still engage and not allow that to um, to break the relationship. 
Okay, thank you. Um, lots of really good questions coming in. Um, a couple of people asking about pricing. Um, the, the overall program is £4,990. And if you want to find more information about the program itself, please email me. My details will be coming up. Um, very pertinent at the moment, I want to take a question from Tom about mental health. Um, mm. He says he's a mental health first aider. And mm. do you think, Courtney, that um, your current mental state might affect the outcomes on these sorts of assessments that you're taking? Say, you know, you've, mm. you've come off a really bad shift and then you take this assessment. What do you think the implications are there? Cool. Right. Yeah. So, so there's something in personality called state and trait. Um, and so trait by definition is your long-term characteristic pattern. Um, state is that, that temporary state of that mood you're in. And so a mood is a state um, that can fluctuate quite a bit, um, right? Depending on that situation, that circumstance, that moment in time can really affect your mood. But our personality tests are written not to capture moods and states, but to capture traits over time. This is one reason why um, many personality tests, the the good ones anyway, are long and you feel like, I've already answered this question. Why are they asking me again? Um, that's built in on purpose to measure um, kind of who you are over time. So it's not actually the exact same question. It's worded a little bit slightly differently to maybe capture a different perception of it or a different time or a different moment. So the tests are built purposefully um, to capture this characteristic long-term pattern and not just um, a short momentary mood. And that's one reason why uh, reliability and validity are so important um, for understanding that, that this is a reliable and valid test we're using because it actually does predict your personality over time. That's great, Courtney. Thank you. I know when I did the test and I've got a fairly young family, I think it also helped to sort of have, um, give myself some quality time, you know, give mm -hmm. myself, allow myself that 20, 30 minutes to be able to, to do the test in a slightly yeah. calmer environment. Um, and that, I know that helped. Yes. Um, we've, got, we've got a great comment from Bob about the, the place for honesty and moral courage, which I, I personally love. But I also think that the, the, this sense about um, um, psychometric assessments is it, it starts a brilliant conversation. Yeah. So I know there's people out there mentioning different kind of, uh, 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 psychometric assessments and that there's probably sort of a, a, a one size does not fit all yeah but I love the fact that it starts these interesting and reflective com uh, 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 conversations yeah exactly um, we've got time for one last question Courtney uh, if I haven't read out your question I, I am sorry we are limited for time but what I will do is take them offline and have a chat with Courtney and, and answer you uh, personally sure. uh, but the last question I want to raise is is there any research to indicate personality types uh, and their fit with careers Right. Okay. Um, so personality types um, is, is, is a specific phrase um, and then um, specific careers. So let me just say a word about types. So types are different than traits. Um, so types, the Myers-Briggs is a type indicator. Types are categorical. Um, so in the Myers-Briggs, for example, you have introversion and extroversion. So types say you're one or the other, no middle ground, which one are you? Um, and so those are types versus traits are on a normal distribution. So as I mentioned on these HDS, you get a score of one to a hundred. So you're, you're somewhere on this curve um, and those are how we measure traits. So one of the problems with types is it puts you in a category. Um, where actually you might not be so clearly or you might be more in the middle. Um, so just to be careful of the word um, types, um, assuming that we're just kind of talking about personality traits generally and um, different fit for different jobs. Yeah, there is research out there that different personality traits fit better in different kinds of jobs, um, but the correlations aren't that strong. Um, so there, there is evidence, um, but I would say take it with a grain of salt because if, if you don't have that perfect personality trait for that perfect career, it doesn't mean that it's not going to work for you. It's just recognizing then, okay, maybe that's not the perfect fit for me. But if that's something you really want to do, then figure out what is it about it that attracts you? What are the things that maybe might not be such a great fit for you and how you want to overcome that? Um, so yeah, there is some evidence out there. Um, so you can take that into account, but um, also recognize that um, the strength of that evidence um, is not so strong. 
Well, that's, that's, that's great, Courtney. Again, you're giving us opportunities because if I'm in, the, in what may be the wrong fit for me in terms of yeah. career, there's still opportunities if I love that career and want to yeah. pursue it. Yes, That's definitely. really, really been helpful. I'm going to have to end the questions there, unfortunately, folks. Just a quick reminder that we have had several other uh, webinars, free webinars in this series. The first one, Success Doesn't Happen About Accident, by accident, um, was related to strategy and innovation. The second one, Getting Things Done, that was about leadership and project management. And this session today, Understanding Your Leadership DNA, will be going online on our YouTube channel shortly. So you can subscribe and you can watch it again. So for now, all it remains for me to do is to say thank you to my colleagues, uh, Courtney and Dane, for their, their time today. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Some nice things to take away as well. Um, Dane, do you want to say a last few words? <laughs> on mute. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, just thank you for everyone who attended today. Please do get in touch with Kieran if you have any further questions, and I'm happy as well um, to share my email should you need it as well. But thank you very much for everyone who attended. And thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Kieran, for thank you. helping run this webinar. All right. Thank you, everyone. You have a very pleasant afternoon. Mm -hmm.